Good Sunday morning to you. This is the Meek Street Church of Christ, and my name is Brian Mead, and I'm here today to study God's Word with you. This is the, the first day of the week, the time of gathering as God's people, the saints of God come together, and as we try to do, offer our worship to God in spirit and in truth. Hope you have your Bibles ready. We're talking about God's Word today. This is my part to talk about the lesson that's prepared from the Word of God itself. We're going to look at a lesson that talks about what we do as God's people. As we think about the things that God requires of us, there are times when there is an order of operation, and there's times when it is of first importance that we look at things from a first of all type of attitude of what must I do first and what is the most important thing that I should be doing and, and, and trying to do what God says to do in the proper way. First of all, let's look at our lesson text. In 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 1 through 4, here where Paul says, Now I make known to you, brethren, the gospel which I preached to you, which also you received, in which you also stand, by which also you are saved, if you hold fast the word which I preached to you, unless you believed in vain. For I delivered to you as of first importance, or other translations, first of all. And that's really the title of our lesson. It comes with that phrase, the new King James, the old King James, they delivered to them first of all uh, importance. What I also received that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, and that he was buried and that he was raised on the third day according to the scriptures. And so we see the facts of the gospel as Paul lays them out for them and things that they believe and that they hang on to that it must keep in their minds if they desire to be saved. And that's really the sin of the gospel is what Jesus did on that Roman cross for our sins. As we look at this today, our lesson is talking about what this idea means of first of all. It can at times refer to first importance or rank as something and like Jesus who has all preeminence. He is the firstborn from the dead. As the Bible tells us that that's the preeminent one who has risen from the dead. That's not talking about he's the firstborn ever to be uh, raised to no longer die, but refers to the idea of his rank in that regard. It can also be priority. So we often will use Matthew chapter 6, verse 33, seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things shall be added to you. In other words, you put this at the top of your list of your priorities. But then also we understand it can mean time order. There's times of certain things that you do in sequence and you get that sequence out of alignment and it does not work well. Now, like when I was younger, I took geometry in high school. And one of the things that impressed me the most was the idea of the order of operation. Things that you have to do, and you do this thing first and then the other thing. And there's a sequence that has to take place in order to get the problem right and solving the answer. In geometry, you have to have the right sequence, the right order. And so that's what we'll look at today from that perspective. I want you to think about that in that way. I don't remember all those formulas and all those things that I studied back then. Uh, that was one of my favorite subjects, though, of geometry. I wish I could remember some of those order of operations and things like that. But, but here we're, we're talking about in a spiritual sense, what first has to happen. If we're going to make big sacrifices for Jesus and for God, we have to first give self to the Lord. We have to ourselves be given to the Savior. And 2 Corinthians chapter 8, verses 1 through 5 teaches that's that very fact. It says, Moreover, brethren, make known to the grace of God bestowed on the churches of Macedonia, that in the great uh, trial of affliction, the abundance of their joy and their deep poverty abounded in the riches of their liberality. In other words, they were generous givers. Even though they were poor, they were generous in what they were giving and willing to give as Paul would say to them, that that's an example to the Corinthians on how they ought to give. And so he says, if I bear witness that according to their ability, yes, and beyond their ability, they were freely willing, imploring us with much urgency that we receive the gift and the fellowship of the ministering to the saints, and not as we had hoped, but they first gave themselves to the Lord and then to us by the will of God. 
you know the story that behind this, the saints of God needed help. And there was times of famine that the saints would reach out to other saints and give them that need, that help and that need as far as money and things reserved. And that's the sense what they did, the collection that was given to the saints. And so here is what Paul says about that. That last part, that last verse, verse five, is the key to it all. The reason why they were so willing to be so generous is because they first gave themselves to the Lord and then to us by the will of God. And that says a lot about their heart, their character, and who they were. And you imagine, if you think about that, someone who's wanting to make a great sacrifice, but they're uncommitted to the cause, does that really ever happen today? And that's really the application for us today. If we think about it in terms of people of God, that happened over 2,000 years ago when the saints of God did that for other saints. The Bible says, would anyone, actually, my question today is, would anyone make big sacrifices for something they are not sold out to? That's really a phrase saying you're not committed, you're not really devoted, not giving of self, if that's the case. Well, the question would be no. We understand the answer to that question would be no. The fact that if I'm not willing to give to something I don't believe in, if the cause is not what I believe in, I'm not going to give, especially give my life for something or my money, my time, my treasure, whatever the case may be, the sacrifices that we would do. So the order of operation in this is first give yourself to the Lord, and then you're able to fully serve God and make those commitments and sacrifices that need to be made. And that's really the major problem of the rich young ruler that Matthew 19 speaks of. This man who came to Jesus said, what good thing must I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus told him to keep the commandments and that he would to also, if he wants to be perfect, in other words, if you want to do everything you need to do, you go and sell what you have and give to the poor. Come and follow me and you'll have treasure in heaven. And the Bible tells us he was not willing to do that. And it even goes on to talk about how hard those who trust in riches, Jesus would say, would be able to go into heaven. Jesus said it's easier for a camel to go to an eye of an eagle than for the rich man to enter into heaven. And so we have, to, we have to look at those words that Jesus tells us that if I am willing to, to do a lot of things but not surrender all, then that's not enough. As one person said, if, if, we're, if Jesus is not Lord of all, then he is, if we're not able to do that in our lives, I, I'll get that straight in a moment. If Jesus as, is not Lord of, of all, then he is not Lord to us in any respect. So we have to be very careful about that. I've forgotten that phrase, but you, you know the passage, the one I'm thinking about there. And Ananias and Sapphira, they were not willing to give self. You know, that's just really saying that they were wanting to give some, but not all. They wanted to keep back part of the price of the land in Acts 5, verses 1 through 10, and they lost their lives because they lied to Peter and also to the Holy Spirit in that process as well. So we have to be very careful and be willing to do give all, not be like Ananias and Sapphira, but we also need to be like Barnabas and others. And the question comes after reading Acts chapter 4, 34 to 37, we'll find out that they were able to, to give like they should. The question comes, did Barnabas and others give self to the Lord first? And that's an emphatic yes, isn't it? The fact that they were able to give of themselves. Let's read the passage, though. It's easy to say that, that they did this, but let's, look, let's see what they did in the New Testament. The Bible says in verse 34, here's a time when the people of God, they were there in Jerusalem. They were, again, needs to be met of the saints. And the Bible tells us in verse 34, but there was not a needy person among them, the church there at Jerusalem. For all who were owners of land or houses would sell them and bring the proceeds of the sales and lay them at the apostles' feet and they would be distributed to each as any had need. Now Joseph, a Levite of Cyprian birth, who was also called Barnabas by the apostles, which translated means son of encouragement and who, and who owned a tract of land sold it and brought the money and laid it at the apostles' feet. And that is when they see Ananias and Sapphira in chapter 5. They want to imitate the, about to say, the deed that Barnabas did, but they weren't willing to go all the way. Barnabas was and did go all the way because he first gave himself to the cause of Christ. That's what we have to do if we want to be right with God. 
And next we come to the idea of first cleansing the inside. They're talking about inside of ourselves. You know, there's an outer man, which we see here, the hands and fingers, eyes, head, legs, and, and all the body, you might say. And then there is the inner man. That's the part of you that lives on after this, this body has is already buried in, into the ground. Matthew 23 speaks about the time when Jesus would talk to those Pharisees. He said, but blind Pharisee, cleanse the inside of the cup that the outside of them may be clean also. In other words, you need to first cleanse the inside of the cup. What if you came to my house and I offer you a beverage, maybe a, a cup of, of Coke or some kind of beverage, maybe coffee, and say, we well, you know, here's a beautiful cup. I'll get my best cup out. And I hear it is, you see it's shiny. I've cleansed it. I've cleaned it all the time. And, and it just looks so shiny and good. But what about if you look inside before I pour the drink in? And you would see I've never cleaned the inside, maybe a couple of years down the road, never cleaned the inside. I'd say, well, I'll just clean the outside, not worry about the inside. Now, would you drink that, knowing the contaminants, all the things that might float around in that cup if you pour in that beverage, coffee, and all that? Well, that's really what Jesus is saying, that it's not enough just to cleanse the outside. It does no good, in other words, to just simply cleanse the outside of the cup without cleansing the inside. Now, that's important, is that both are required. And Jesus says, if you're really right with God, it takes the cleansing of the inside first, then you work on the outside. We have to work on our heart first. And another question comes, how much good does it do to only cleanse the outside of a cup? I would say very little, if any, because no one wants to drink out of a cup that only has the outside clean and not the inside. Jesus is reminding them by that physical example that we need to have a heart that is cleansed and also the body, the outside, what people see in us, in the outward appearance, that also needs to be clean as well. And what did Jesus say about the heart? That's what we're talking about, this inner man, the heart that's within inside, not the blood pump, but it's the mind. It's the what you think with and how your thoughts come from your mind and emotions and part of man talk, refers to the heart there. In Matthew 15, verses 18 and 19, the Bible tells us there, from the heart proceeds thefts and murders and adulteries and so forth. And so he says, that's what defiles the man. And so it's not to eat with unwashed hands. Those Pharisees were so worried about eating with unwashed hands rather than worrying about the heart. That's what they should be concerned about because they had a problem with their heart. And as the question inevitably comes, inevitably comes, is Jesus going to judge the world or the outside, judge the outward man or the heart, the inner man, I should say? Well, he's talking about judgment in Acts chapter 17, verse 31. God has appointed Jesus to judge this world in righteousness, the Bible tells us. At the end, the Bible tells us Jesus will be there, at the, we'll all be there in the judgment seat of Christ. Now, is he going to look at the outside of us? and say, well, you know, here you've done all these outward deeds and things like that, like the Pharisees who stood on the, the corner and would pray with himself and say things and, and just to be seen of men. If that's the case, they were all right. They had nothing to worry about, these Pharisees and the scribes and the hypocrites, as he would call them. But there's more to it, isn't it? We understand God's going to judge the inner man, what we do and what people don't see us do, the hypocrisy that lies within that we don't take care. You know, these, these Jews, at this time when Jesus came, they were selling. They were robbing widows of their houses. They were full of extortion and such things like that. They were greedy a lot of times. They loved money. Jesus even commented on the fact that, you know, if you love money, that's not proper with God. That's an abomination in the sight of God. And so they was highly esteemed among men, but yet God looked at it as not at all important at all. And so Jesus would condemn just the outer cleansing. We need to clean the heart, get it right with God. And that everything will fall in place in that case. And then we come to another first. First, remove the plank from your own eye. Now, oftentimes people in the world will say, you know, you don't need to talk about my sins that I'm not willing to repent of. I'm not going to willing to change in any respect. Oftentimes, Matthew chapter 7, verses 1 through 5 are spoken of. 
and are used by people who maybe not know anything else about the Bible. They know this passage, judge not lest you be not or be judged in this regard. So they're trying to say, well, don't judge me. You're going to be judged if you judge me. No, that's not what Jesus is saying. That's really taken out of context of what Jesus is actually trying to say to us. Let's look at the passage first of all. Verse 1 says, do not judge so that you will not be judged. For in the way you judge, you will be judged. And by the, your standard of measure, it will be measured to you. Why do you look at the speck that is in your brother's eye, but do not notice the log that is in your own eye? It goes on verse 4 it says, Or how can you say to your brother, Let me take the speck out of your eye, and behold, the log is in your own eye? You hypocrite, first take the log out of your own eye, and then you'll see clearly to take the speck out of your brother's eye. Now, verse 5 is actually the key to it all, isn't it? If you think about that, it, just, it says, If you're going to judge someone, you better be ready to have some judgment back if you have sin in your life. And that's basically what Jesus is saying. So you need to be able to see clearly to help someone else with their sin. It's not trying to help someone unless we do that. very. That's the time operation. That's the order of operation. First, take care of your sins. Then you can help someone else. Is Jesus saying not to help your brother? No, that's not what Jesus is saying. Jesus is not saying don't ever try to help them, help someone with their sin because of other passages. The Bible says in James chapter 5 that a person tries to convert a sinner from the error of his way, that he will save a soul from death and hide a multitude of sins. And Galatians 6 verse 1, we'll talk about in a minute, also talks about the fact that we see someone is overtaken in the fault. You who are spiritual restore that one in the spirit of meekness. So Jesus is not saying that. But what is the order of operations? We've already said, we've stated, help yourself first and then help others. And I know that we're not perfect. We're not able, you know, we all have to come to the conclusion that the gospel is right. Jesus is right telling us about what is sin and, and the need to stay out of that sin. And if anyone comes to us, helps us with our sins, they're our best friend in that regard. In Galatians 6 verse 1, the Bible says, uh, tells us again, I mentioned that if a brother, someone who's a member of the church is overtaken in the fault, and they may not even see this fault. I think that's the idea of Galatians 6, 1, is they don't see the error that they're involved, this, this sin that's overtaken them. But yet he's telling those who are spiritual, restore such a one. Now, what does Paul say about the one who is restored, the man overtaken the fault? They are the ones who are spiritual, not just someone who is a, a bold, brass sinner is to come and to restore that person, but it's someone who knows the truth of God's word and is striving to live of that truth. If they do that, they're doing exactly what Paul says to do, to help remove the plank from that person's eye, the speck that's in that person's eye. You know, sin is sin. Whether it's a speck or it's a log, all of it needs to have gotten out because Think about it. One sin's enough to condemn us. That's why we have to be careful about living our lives in unrepentant sin and going down the way of saying, well, I'm not going to change. I'm not going to do anything because I don't have to. And then there's another of one of these of, of time operations. First, be reconciled to your brother. That's found in Matthew chapter 5, verses 23 and verse 24. Here where Jesus says, on the Sermon on the Mount, it says, therefore, if you bring your gift to the altar and then remember that your brother has something against you, leave your gift there before the altar and go your way. First, be reconciled to your brother and then come and offer your gift. In other words, if there's some problem that I'm having with someone, especially my brother, uh, someone, it could be anyone. If we have problems that we could work out, but we're simply not doing that. Jesus says, leave your gift. You know, he's talking about in the Old Testament. They bring their gifts and sacrifices to the priest. There he's saying, you put that off. You postpone that. He didn't say that's not important. We'll say that in a minute. But yet he's saying it's better for you to be reconciled than worship as God. Well, that's that time order of operation that needs to take place. Again, the question comes, is Jesus saying that the sacrifice is not important? It was commanded by the law of Moses. They did that under the, the old covenant. And that's why they had to do those things. But yet it's equally important that your relationship is just as important as the service to God. Both of you right, your relationship with God 
but also horizontally and vertically. As we think about horizontal relationships between our family members, our brothers and sisters in Christ, anyone, he's talking about uh, in the context of brethren who were Jews, but yet I'm thinking that Jesus is placing a high priority on our personal relationships, that we need to be able to have nothing against someone and someone needs not have anything against us because that's how we can truly worship God in spirit and in truth when we have the right uh, mind frame of forgiveness that, that we've, we've took care of this matter, there's closure, and now I can worship God with a good conscience because of this closure. And I want to talk about in essence of this one, number five, he first found his own brother. This talks about evangelism, doesn't it? As the story tells us in John chapter 1, 40 to 42, here where, where Peter comes to Christ. Well, how did he get to Christ? Well, it was through his own brother, Andrew, the Bible tells us. And in verse 40, it says, one of the two who heard John speak and followed him was Andrew, Simon's brother. He first found his own brother, Simon, and said to him, we have found the Messiah, which is translated the Christ. And he brought him to Jesus. And that says a lot about his brother. Not a lot has been said about Andrew. We don't have a lot of recorded deeds that Andrew did, but the one thing he's recorded and he's famous for in the scriptures from this verse is that he brought Peter, his own brother, to Jesus. And I think that speaks a lot about who he was and what they were trying to do as a family. As he didn't want to leave his brother out, that he wanted to include brother Peter, Simon, my own brother, to the to meet Jesus, because that's what they were looking for. They're looking for the Messiah, Jesus, to be there. What does that say about where evangelism needs to begin? I think that's the point that many times is emphasized, and rightfully so, that evangelism should start at home, that when we come to services, and, and preachers especially need to realize that your evangelism, and even everybody in the church, needs to realize if before we go out into the world and preach the gospel to every creature, all creation, as Matthew 28 refers to, Mark 16, 15 and 16, talks about baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. That's what Matthew 28 says. Then Matthew uh, talks about teaching and observe all things whatsoever I've commanded you. And so that's evangelism, making disciples and helping them to obey the gospel. Well, what about our kids? You know, as parents, we need to think about what about our own kids? You know, they are going to be our first priority. Whether you don't have to be a preacher to, to evangelize to your kids and to have Bible studies and do things with your kids. You know, during this pandemic, it has tested a lot because, you know, we weren't able to meet like we wanted to at the building. We're trying to get back to that now. And so that helps us a lot to know that evangelism is something that, that was up to the parents. And they had a responsibility in some regard to, to help their children to grow and to be faithful to God in that respect. And we come to the last point. This is, again, our lesson about first of all. When you look at the idea of first, learn piety at home. You may think, well, what in the world is piety? That's not talking about pie or any kind of thing like that, eating pie and things like that. It's talking about the kind of life that God wants us to live of, of returning the kind of things we had from our parents and the idea of godliness in showing us kind of life in that regard. First Timothy 5 verse 4 tells us, but if any widows has children or grandchildren, let them learn to show piety at home and repay their parents, for this is good and acceptable for God. And so he's talking about responsibilities of home and what the church and it helps needy widows and things like that. That's one of the subjects of First Timothy 5 about uh, some would they be, all the widows be helped by the treasury or by putting on the roll and helping them in, in their daily needs? Or was it just some in regard to that? It was limited. I believe it's limited in respect because the Bible limits it there. And so the children or the grandchildren were to have this response. Let them learn to show piety at home. You may think, well, what does this word, word mean? Well, it comes from the Greek word refers to reverence, to show piety, and also, as Biden refers to it as, in 1 Timothy 5, verse 4, this is actually the definition of this, it's used in 1 Timothy 5, verse 4, of the obligation on the part of children and grandchildren to express in a practical way their dutifulness toward their own family. 
that was responsibility for helping their parents, helping them with their needs. And that's what parents do when they get older. They need that, don't they? Parents had done a lot for us. It's only right, Paul would say, for the, for the children and the grandchildren to, to rise up on the occasion and help their parents have this kind of needs being met. And that shows us, again, what kind of responsibilities. You know, he mentions the idea of, of the widows indeed, and there's qualifications for that. You read 1 Timothy chapter 5, the Bible says he has a reputation of good works. If she has brought up children, if she's shown hospitality to strangers, if she has washed the saints' feet, if she has assisted those in distress, and if she has devoted herself to every good work. It was not the younger widows that we put on the roll. It was limited only to those who met that qualification, those qualifications. But then also verse 16, or actually verse 14, says, therefore I want the younger widows to get married, bear children, keep house, and give the enemy no occasion for reproach. But, you know, we understand the Bible tells us that we need to have this idea of doing what's right and proper when it comes to this. Now, verse 16 is one I will look at and close this lesson. But verse 16 says, if any woman who's a believer has, de has dependent widows, she must assist them and the church must not be burdened. So that may, it might assist those who are widows in thee. It says, so it may assist those who are widows in thee. What does that mean to us today? Practically speaking, it's the responsibility of family to help family. And if that's not possible, then that's when the church steps in and, and from the treasury helps those who are in need in that regard. So it says a lot about family responsibility, doesn't it? That we all should not neglect our, our parents. That's why we need to have a good relation, honor father and mother, and do what's right in that regard. You know, we understand our parents did so much for us that we could not repay them enough. They took care of us when we were babies. They had sleepless nights and they took care of us, fed us and clothed us, things we could not do ourselves. It's only fitting and proper that we repay them in this way. So first learn piety at home in this regard. What does that say about our duties in the home that we're not without responsibilities, first of all, but then also that we need to have this kind of responsibility given to us and shoulder that responsibilities and to do what's right and live for the Lord Jesus Christ. Hope you've enjoyed the lesson of the hour today. We talked about some things that are extremely important when it comes to first of all responsibilities. As we mentioned Matthew 6 and verse 33, seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things to be added to you. If you've not obeyed the gospel, then you need to be part of God's kingdom. Then you can seek first. You know, that command is not going to be able to, something you can do first of all until you put on Christ. And then you can put God's kingdom first because you cannot do that until you are a member of that kingdom. How do we do that? It's by faith in Jesus Christ, repentance of your sins, confession of Jesus Christ, the Son of God, and then baptism for the remission of sins. That's what Jesus told Nicodemus about being born of the water and of the Spirit. So we can be saved by the very blood of Christ. When this life is over, we can say, I was born again because of Christ's blood. Again, I thank you very much for your kind attention. Hope you have a good day. God bless.